Okay, so uh, good morning, every everybody. We're uh, crossing the Humber Bridge uh, today, uh, going across to the South Bank and moving out of Yorkshire. Uh, but the South Bank here uh, was Humberside uh, between 1974 and 1996. So I don't know if that counts for anything. And today it's North Lincolnshire, so part of Lincolnshire, back where it be belongs. Um, I only came across uh, Barton upon Humber earlier this year when I decided to cross the Humber Bridge to see what was at the other side. It might make a bit more than the talk uh, this this morning, uh, but we'll see how we go on because there's actually a, a lot to see uh, in this small place. And uh, I don't know how many of you have been to see it before, but if you haven't, you'd probably be quite surprised and maybe want to spend three pounds crossing the bridge there and back to have a, have a look at it. So let's have a look at the sort of geology of it. And like I say, it's similar to that of the North Bank, but slightly different is that the chalk dips down under the Humber, uh, but rises about half a mile inland from the foreshore here. So the actual town of Barton-upon-Humber sits on the chalk escarpment, but the foreshore area where the haven is sits on clay. And that's what we can see here, this picture uh, down here, the clay, the flat clay that goes inland for about half a mile, three quarters of a mile, uh, and then the chalk rises up again from that. These are some ings or ponds, and they were dug during the sort of uh, 18th, 19th, uh, and up until really 1959. They dug the clay here for the brick and tile industry. So we'll be able to look at that a, a little later. Later, later, later on. And it also accounts for when I mentioned last week, when we look at the Humber Bridge, is that because of a deeper depth of clay this end, is that the southern tower of the uh, Humber Bridge is driven, piled down 115 feet, whereas at the northern end, it's just 26 foot into the uh, riverbank before it reaches the chalk. So that's the sort of difference you see, this great sort of swathe of uh, clay at this end as well. It was sort of... Uh, first sort of probably um, associated with early man, they found lots of uh, bits and pieces uh, on, the, on the chalk, and I mentioned some of that a little later on, but it was really the Romans who came here. They built the road from Lincoln to Wintringham, uh, which is about seven miles to the west of uh, Barton-upon-Humber, and they crossed there to, to Bruff on the uh, northern bank. But that's today, that's the A15. The A15 sort of being rerouted now and actually goes over the Humber Bridge. But they built a road from the A, from the Ermine Street across to Barton, largely because it's got a haven there, which is like a small inlet. And because of the muddy conditions on the bank, that was the nearest sort of haven to it on the south bank of the Humber. So that's really sort of the Romans came in here and started using that inlet. And it's really been used ever since, really from that uh, photograph right at the very beginning. And because it became quite a popular port to disgorge goods and things like that. Uh, but with the founding of Hull, then it sort of lost that impetus and really then became a satellite from Hull with a ferry going between Hull and uh, Barton upon Humber right through to about 1851 and then ceased uh, altogether. So it sort of fell into a, a bit of a backwater since then. And really not until the 1990s, we'll see, but a lot of industry started to locate in this area. So, um, I say, uh, I say, really, when the opening of the Humber Bridge in 1981, it started to grow to grow again. So let's have a quick look at the area we're going to have a look at. I'm coming uh, here across the Humber Bridge, opened in 1981. You keep on that approach road, the A15, as I mentioned, and you're coming off at the first junction here. Because uh, if you've not been before, I'll just show you a bit of film on this. Brings you up to a roundabout, you're turning left at the roundabout and brings you into the town. It's going to say there's another roundabout there. It's not really well marked, really. It's, uh, uh, the signposts that say Wilderspin School. So if you follow those signposts saying Wilderspin School, it brings you into the town centre because really it's split into two halves. Uh, so on this map here, we've got Barton on Humber here, but there's a lot of things around here, uh, places that you want to visit. There's the Water's Edge Centre, there's a rope work, the old tile works here, and these are the Ings, which are like a nature reserve today. So there's a lot on this sort of the bank of it because they the distance from there to there, half a mile to three quarters of a mile. So it's uh, you, say you normally drive between the two. So let's have a quick look at the first bit of film here, uh, coming up to the Humber Bridge and just crossing it again. Picking up from last week, uh, where I crossed half the Humber Bridge and now completing the rest of it. 
there's only uh, some music on this. So that's the tower there that's piled 115 feet deep into the bank. I think I mentioned last week, the carriageway is about 100 foot above the water level. Over here, that's the haven there. Uh, and then over this side, you can see a, a brick chimney there. That's the old tile works as well, which we'll be visiting later on. And the town of Barton on Humber is over in this area. You can just see how it rises up slightly. So that's really the start of the chalk of the uh, Lincolnshire Wolds there. So this is all bars and the, the new properties. So I've come up the uh, the ramp from the from the A15, coming into town. This is the first roundabout you come on, come across, uh, and going straight across this roundabout. I'm going to say it's mostly modern housing this uh, side, but you'd be very surprised when you have to get into the town centre. It's mostly Georgian and Victorian housing. It's a very pretty town centre. So coming down to the second round, I'm at the edge of the town centre. It's in like an H shape, so the road there coming down from the right is one of the legs of the H. And this here is bringing me into the middle of the high street. It's where this uh, built, this pub is here. I think it's the Red Lion. The high street then curves around and goes down towards the haven itself. But here we've actually going to start into the town properly itself. So just a, oops, a map of the town. So I'm at point A just here, so just by that pub, the Red Lion, coming into the High Street round here. And then I'm looking at a, a gathering of buildings around here called Queen Street. And there's quite a lot of uh, things to see there. Coming along and towards the end, I think it's called Burgate, we've got two churches. They're really within a thousand feet of one another. There's St Mary's there I've marked up and St Peter's here where that red dot is. Then I'm coming down the town to Baysgarth House, uh, which is also a museum in this large park of 30 acres that it's set in. Coming back into the town centre, this is the old market square here, and coming down this leg of the H or the crossbar of the H to form my circle around town. I could have gone straight forward along here, but there isn't much of an interest coming back to that same roundabout that we've entered in. So you can actually really do a circle of a town. But this street here, George Street, uh, is one of the main shopping streets as well. So they tend to be on that H across here. So let's have a look at... Uh, uh, the town centre itself, because I said uh, the first part of it coming in on that uh, little roundabout uh, to the, uh, is it the old red, yeah, the Red Lion Hotel, start of the uh, high street. Uh, and it's, the, the behind me, the high street continues and then turns into a road called Fleet Gate. Fleet Gate goes down to the Haven. Unfortunately, it's one way. So if you're coming into, uh, Barton upon Humber, you can't actually go down it, but that's got some of the oldest properties on there. There's a house down there dated 1325, and there's some other sort of large Georgian mansions as well. So it was really a place to live uh, in, in, in Barton, because that's built up on the clay. And we're really here at the bottom of the clay. So the town just slightly slopes up to the right hand side and it sits on chalk uh, uh, along there. Has a population of around about 11,000 uh, people today. Its biggest employer is Wren Kitchens. Uh, they employ 5,000 people in total in, in Yorkshire. They tend to have a couple of factories here. They have one out at Howden. So they, they manufacture those fitted kitchens. They're the largest fitted kitchen manufacturer in Britain. And I can say uh, in 2020, they were due to start uh, expanding and creating 1,200 new posts at Barton upon Humber. But I think that's probably sort of a, a way laid at the moment. So let's move down uh, High Street. They, it's mostly uh, independent shops down here. I've got some film of driving the whole journey around here. Uh, and then we're coming to this junction here. Uh, and to the left hand side is Queen Street. So that's quite an important one to go down. I don't actually drive down there because it's hard work to get back. So I've done a circle uh, in the car so it's easier to see. This place here at the junction of Queen Street 
is the Odd Fellows Hall. So it's this very large uh, building. The Odd Fellows were a self-help and friendly society actually formed in Manchester in 1810 in the Road Makers pub over there. And it's one of those things where you paid in weekly into as a subscription into that, and it would page you out in Hill, ill health and, and at other times as well. But part of its ethos is it was a, it was a social uh, side to it as well. And so they built this hall here in uh, 1864, because they be, it was illegal, this sort of self-help uh, um, group uh, until 1851. I think that people, the government saw it as being sort of a, a union type of thing, which it wasn't at all. It was more of a social type thing. And that's why it was probably built these Odd Fellows Hall here. This is probably the largest one I've seen, because uh, they dated in 1864. It lasted uh, until 1911 as an Odd Fellows Club, and then became the first cinema in Barton upon Humber, and then became other things since then. It's been a roller skating rink. I think it's been a nightclub. Club, uh, uh, as well. And uh, you say one of the social sides of the Odd Fellows Club is that they would uh, raise funds for things. So one of the first things they did here uh, at Barton was raise funds in 1868 for the lifeboat, the RNL lifeboat at Cleethorpe. So that's one side of them they did. In 1988, it became redundant, and the ground floor is actually converted into cottages. But the hall, or the lecture room, the cinema, the dance hall upstairs, is redundant, and uh, you say it's up for sale. And it's, uh, the houses are actually quite cheap in uh, Barton upon Humber. I think people are put off from crossing the uh, the Humber Bridge, costing three pounds a day, uh, and maybe. Cottingham, Hessel and North Therabay uh, are, say, are more attractive to people who work in Hull. You can buy that. It's a cash buyer only, it says, for £95,000 for that top floor uh, of, of that Odd Fellows Hall. I'm moving down this road, uh, Queen's Street, because there are really sort of three or four buildings down here, which are quite important, all gathered at the top there. So we're going to have a look at uh, this one first. Uh, I can get my cursor there. This is called the assembly rooms, but it actually wasn't built as an assembly rooms, and it wasn't a assembly rooms Edwards would probably think that it that that it would be. It was actually built in uh, 1843 as a temperance hotel, so that's what they served on the ground floor, and they sort of had a lecture uh, hall on the first floor up there. In 1903, uh, say it was sold off and the churches in the town bought this really as a church hall. Uh, and you can say it lasted like that until 1976, uh, when it passed to the local Barton upon Humber uh, Council. And you can say it sort of remains uh, in that ownership today. They have a not-for-profit organization uh, called CHAMP, Community Heritage arts and uh, media project that help run facilities in the town. So they're sort of a, a not-for-profit organization that have taken over the running of these buildings that otherwise might not have uh, been run uh, by other uh, groups. We'll see uh, the, uh, the, the museum is also run by them. So that's the assembly rooms on one side, still in use today for weddings and other types of things. Uh, straight opposite it, although it says Salvation Army on it today, this was built as a primitive Methodist chapel in 1867. Closed as such in 1961 and then became the Salvation Army and has remained that way ever since. Uh, I understand that the inside still has its great balcony up, up, up on the inside. The rear of it has now been sold off as an extension to that and that belongs to the Wilderspin School uh, that is next door. So let's uh, talk about that. Let's have a look at this school. Uh, and you can say you go in there and the brown tourist signs do say Wilderspin School on it. It meant nothing to me uh, at all. Uh, but this school was built in 1844 to a design by a chap called Samuel Wilderspin. And uh, you can say it then became a national school. But we can, it's open as a museum, so you can go and have a, a look inside of this as, as well. Wasn't the only school on this street. Just below here in these trees is another building uh, that was a charity school that was built in 1831 and later became a British school, an interdenominational school, uh, and that closed in 1858. Largely probably uh, the success of this school here is that they couldn't uh, keep the children at the, uh, the charity school. Maybe there's a bit of a stigma attached to that. 
So this school is is open uh, and you can say it's a museum in this building here and then this building down there is a cafe down there. So we can have a look at that. But a bit a bit about Samuel Wilderspin. He was born in London in 1791. And he was homeschooled by his parents. And after, I think at the age of eight, they decided to send him off to school. Uh, and he was only there a few months when they pulled him out. And I'm thinking he, they didn't want him to learn by rote uh, when everybody had to chant things like that, because it was actually holding his education back. In fact, it was in advance of those. So he came back to uh, home and to be, uh, to be le learned by his parents then. And they, could say they were sort of, business people so that had some sort of money behind them to sort of I guess employ a, a governess or something like that to to teach him and I can say that sort of education by his parents then led him to in 1820 to open his own school in London to begin with and he was really then became an educationalist after that of infants really from three to seven years old or somewhere in that things and he really had four rules the first one being probably very apt today that children are, are properly uh, fed being one of them I guess it's uh, if you didn't want hungry children in the, uh, in the school they'd be disruptive uh, the second one was everything had to be simply explained to them in their own language so it wasn't sort of uh, beyond their means of comprehension uh, and not to overdo everything so uh, and this probably leads into point four but he just, uh, said that exercise and play was vital and it should be regularly done throughout a teaching day and so this uh, he said here a moderate amount of singing alternating with the usual motions and evolutions in the classroom and the unfettered freedom of the playground. So he's really credited uh, with the invention of the playground. And it's said that uh, children at this school would spend around about half a day outside in, in the playground. And that's sort of thing you can see uh, if you go into the museum. He only taught here for six years because uh, he never taught full time either because he's credited with establishing around 2000 of his uh, schools around Britain. But this is the only one that exists today. That's why it's been kept as a museum. He also founded a Wilderspin uh, uh, school in Leeds as well, but I've tried to research where that was and I've, I've no idea where it is uh, because it, the other one probably turned into national schools later on and then into normal primary schools. So this is a traditional uh, classroom that they've kept in the museum to what it would have been like in the 30s or, or the 40s. It's something uh, where the older children would have progressed, i.e. Uh, age eight uh, above till they left school at those days in, in age 12. But the the main hall, the classroom here, uh, could say it had around about 150 infants in, in this hall here. So it must have been terrible. That's probably why I wanted them outside most of the side uh, most of the time. But you can see here, I'm up on those like a, a rake stage uh, up here, or uh, he called it a step teaching gallery. He would, the children would sit on here in the rows and he would teach from down there or the teacher would teach from from down there and then the other activities would be based around here we've got letters of the alphabet on here that they'd have to copy and learn words from i was quite uh, amused by the letter q because it didn't stand for quiet or anything like that which you might imagine but it stood for quince uh, so that uh, they are, probably had a, a good standard of, of, of learning of strange words uh, on that just looking from the other way around so you can see this teaching gallery all his schools were based around that teaching gallery so there weren't any desks in here so that the children could move around so they'd all sit on there down the side of this that leads directly out into the playground because say he meant uh, half a day would be outside in that playground it's a concrete playground today but so there's not much to see uh, apart from the amusing thing there the uh, the toilet block there for the in infants toilets there and he was the first person probably to bring in play equipment into the playground and so he sold those off to other schools as well uh, because there was sort of educational uh, uh, equipment and he also believed in teaching through nature as well so all the playgrounds he uh, had had gardens in them to grow flowers and to grow vegetables uh, 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 as, as well. The school 
closed in uh, 19, uh, uh, 1993 and then was turned into a, a museum, as I've showed you. This is the other hall uh, where the cafe is. It's very impressive in here, I, I, I must say. Uh, and uh, say uh, this is open from Thursday to Sunday, the cafe is, uh, between 10 and 4 o'clock. A very great menu in there as well. But the museum is only open from... 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock on a weekend, on a Saturday and Sunday. But I'd also check on that whether it is going to be open, depending on, obviously, uh, COVID regulations and things. I went the other week and it was open on the Saturday as uh, the museum sometimes closes at 3 o'clock. But if you go in at 3 o'clock, they'll say you can go in anyway. So uh, the lady said, because they more interesting visitors coming in. So that's the Wilderspin School and about his educational achievements uh, down there. Let's move back onto the high street. The uh, Oddfellows Hall, that's the corner of that. That's the Wilders, that's the uh, um, Methodist chapel behind it. So the Wilderspin School is really directly behind the police station. So I'm back here on the high street as well. So this was uh, built in 1847 and was actually in use until 2005 as a police station. The courtroom was this side, because uh, that closed 10 years earlier in 1995. This was the police station of 1847, and this is where the police sergeant lived. That was his house. Like I say, I think that's a vet's now. This is a preschool, the rest of that. So moving down High Street, uh, it can, I think it turns into Burgate, uh, and we come across the first of the churches down here, St Mary. Uh, so this was a, a Norman church, probably built about uh, 1170 uh, to, uh, to begin with. Just uh, looking on the outside, you can say on the notice board uh, there, it has got a very ornate uh, sort of piece of sculpture there. That's by a chap called Philip Pape. Uh, who was a sculptor who lived in Barton between 1960 and 1992. The church is open uh, almost all the time, uh, and like I say, it's one of two churches, because the other church is, is, is literally a minute's walk away, about a thousand foot away, to the right-hand side of this. Uh, and like I say, was probably, this was, church was probably built as a chapel of ease to the other church, uh, and probably first founded maybe 1115 here so something here probably 1070 really and then after that first church built in stone around about 1115 and you can say then uh, uh, grew from that uh, it's largely because it was a chapel of ease because the other church St Peter's which you'll see became a monastic church to Bardney Abbey Barney Abbey is no longer there today, but it stands roughly equidistant between Lincoln and Skegness, around about 40 miles to the south of here. This is open all the time, so you can go in. It closes around about four o'clock, we can go in. Uh, and you can see the sort of different building styles in here. Uh, so we've got these original rounded arches here, which would have been the arches, uh, they think it was rebuilt, uh, I guess say probably 1115. And these more pointed arches over here date from about 1270, probably when the church was widened uh, around there. What's unusual about it, you notice that it's made from limestone, this is, it's not built from the local chalk because it's such a poor building material. This uh, limestone here has come from the, uh, from, tag, from the uh, Tagcaster Quarry, from which York Minster was built, uh, as well as Beverly uh, Minster, Be Beverly uh, um, Minster uh, as well. So this uh, was brought down the wharf into the River Ouse and then offloaded uh, onto the haven here and brought up to build this church. So you can see how important this church was. Some of the other stones actually come from Purbeck in Dorset, so that must have come up the coast as well. That was probably used in the year 1270s. Most of these uh, on the columns down here, that serves a sort of Purbeck uh, stone round there, whereas we see the more rounded columns on this side, the more uh, uh, earlier one. And you can say, looking down there, just at the chancel, that was uh, you can say, added in the 15th uh, century. There's quite a few side chapels as well. There's one here as well, but there's nothing of, of great interest. Uh, you can say the Victorians tiled over the floor. You can say there were some 15th century uh, tombs there, uh, but they were the 
brass plates that had there were all prized off uh, during the sort of the, the Puritans coming along there as well. So there wasn't much to see. So there's no uh, wall monuments or anything like that inside. So just beyond the back of the church and in between the two churches, so this is St Mary's, this is called, uh, was a stream fed pond. Uh, I took this in August on my first visit uh, there and it, say it's completely dried up. So there's natural springs that come out because this is where the sort of chalk meets the, the clay here. So that's why it, we could hear, but uh, because they, in a dry month of, of the August, obviously the springs don't uh, feed into the pond at all. So it, it's dried up. It's said uh, that uh, St Chad, uh, the, the, the monk uh, baptised people here in 669 AD because he founded a monastery at Barrow-upon-Humber. Barrow-upon-Humber is about three miles eastwards of here. So we found him up in the, uh, coming down from Lindis Farm, then coming into sort of Yorkshire, uh, and then obviously down into Lincolnshire uh, as well. So, so as we mentioned, Barthney Abbey, 40 miles away, and then Barrow upon Humber. There's nothing left of it uh, at all. The land where it was is being built over, and I think they're just streets named after the, uh, the monastery that was there. So there's really nothing to see there at all. So I said the second church isn't far away because it's just across the road, as you'll see on the film at the end. This is the older church as, uh, as well. Uh, and because it's thought that a very simple wooden church stood here, probably in the 6th, 7th century, probably after St Chad came and, and uh, because they baptised people in that pond and founded a church here. So that's what uh, uh, this first was. Uh, I guess it stands slightly up above uh, St Mary's because it's on a chalk platform up here. So it would have commanding views of people coming up and down the estuary. They've been, because uh, they stood up there. The church that we see today, the tower end round here, that was built in 970. So it's a, a Saxon church that we can see. I'm going to say that's the bottom part of the tower here. The top part was added uh, by the Normans. And you can see that's uh, made of limestone up here. These arches down here are just ornamental. They don't serve any purpose at all apart to beautify the tower. What's unusual about these arches is that the arches have come from a Roman villa, which had been probably perhaps in Barton itself or further over about seven miles away from Wintingham because that's where they crossed uh, the Humber Estuary to go to Brough. So that's what uh, those are around there uh, as well. And you can say the body of the church, again, similar to St. Mary's across the road, uh, you can say it was rebuilt in 1115. You can say this is after the Lord of the Manor. This was Walter de Gaunt. We've come across him before because he founded Bridlington Priory. He included these manors here in Lincolnshire as well as his lands in Yorkshire. And you can say that he then gave St. Peter the income from this church to support Barthney Abbey. And so that's why it then became a monastic church, whereas the other church then became a, a, a secular church for the townspeople, because they probably weren't allowed in this. And maybe it became uh, William de Gaunt's own private church as well. So that might be why there are two churches really next door to one another. And you can say it has been sort of widened and added to there. Most of the body of the church we see today dates from the 14th century. You can see that's looking from the uh, north side of it as well. The church became redundant in 1972. A lady told me when I was taking these photographs is that blood because it's going to cost more to maintain this church than it was to St Mary's. And so that's why they gave uh, St Peter's uh, away. And in 1974, they had an eight year long dig around here. They took out uh, really the inside of the church, the, the whole of the nave and dug down in there and exhumed uh, 2,800 bodies, uh, ranging from Saxon times right up to the Victorian feet, the, the last ones that have been interred there. And you can say there was, so it was used as a graveyard since that time, but further over on the edge of the town, uh, more towards the haven, there was a, another very early graveyard dating from the same period, six and seven centuries. Uh, and you can say they've done some exhumations uh, around there. You can say it's now um, taken over, was given to English heritage and uh, 
because they've uh, looked after it since 1982. It's open uh, up uh, to go in, uh, but looking through the windows, there isn't a great deal to see inside because remember they took the, uh, the nave floor out. And so it's just a, 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 a completely flat floor in there. And it next opens in March, 2021, it says on their website, and it's five pounds to go in. I wouldn't say there's much to see in there, but there's really an exhibition in there about the findings from the diet and uh, illnesses of people that they exhume their bodies from, really from this uh, fifth, sixth and seventh centuries in there. So that's really all you can see when you go in there. So it seems to me a bit of a steep price to go in there to see a, a fairly simple exhibition uh, within the church uh, itself. So that's not open until uh, next year. So I'm now going to uh, go up further up the town into another area. This is definitely on the chalk hills here and just caught at the edge of the uh, film from the car is Bardney Hall. Uh, so this stands next to a more modern Roman Catholic church. Uh, the house uh, was, uh, was, was a house here in 1557, but largely what we see here dates from 1620 uh, when it was rebuilt for the Nelfort family. They lived here for 200 years and uh, you say, uh, uh, then had it rebuilt. Uh, so I got this the wrong way around. Uh, it was built in the early 1700s, so it's a, a Queen Anne style house uh, uh, as well. Uh, and it was built, built for William Gildas as a private residence. I'm getting confused with the uh, next slide up, up here as well. And uh, it's a bed and breakfast today, so quite a fine one, and stood on the rectory of Bardney Abbey, who had here. So Bardney Abbey said had St Peter's, the rectory stood in this area. So really about 10 minutes walk away from it, slightly higher up from the church itself. Uh, the road here leads to Baysgarth House. Wherever you are in Barton upon Humber, if you stand in the centre of the town, everything's about 10 minutes walk away. Uh, Baysgarth House is probably about the furthest away in, in the town centre. Uh, again, this house here built, this is where I got it wrong last time, built 1557 and then rebuilt in 1620 for the Nelfort family. They lived here for around about 200 years and it passed through various different families and ended up with the Taylor family. In 1930, there were really no inheritors uh, to the Taylor family, and the last of those gave it um, to the house and the gardens of, of the house here to Barton upon Humber Urban District Council, who made it their home in 1997. Uh, today, it's owned by that uh, the, the Champ organisation, and they run it as a museum in here as well. Uh, say it, they started taking over, uh, became a little museum in 1981, now covers the whole of the house. You can't visit it at the moment, uh, largely because I've, that's why I've taken this photograph off the internet. Uh, it's not because of COVID regulations or anything. It's largely, you see that uh, scaffolding on the outside is that repairs are being done to the house. And uh, they estimate that it might not open until February or March next year. So probably worth uh, in the spring going to Barton on Humber if everything's closed here at the moment. Um, I say uh, it's normally open uh, March to October, Thursday to Sunday uh, from 12 noon to four o'clock. And then in the winter months from November to February, weekends only, because they the same time as well. So sometimes quite often it's uh, if you want to go into Barton Humber to look at these things, it's actually better going on a weekend when the museums are open. The gardens here are now a public park. They stretch uh, 30 acres and there's a playground, there's a bowling green, there's also a rose garden. The rose gardens uh, commemorates the work of Chad Vara. He was born in uh, Barton in 1911 and founded the Samaritans in 1954. So that's the importance of him. So I'm turning around there, coming back into the town centre just down the road and coming up into the market square and where you can see up here uh, the last remaining windmill at, at Barton. Uh, there were two mentioned in the Doomsday Book of 1086. These would have been simple post mills where they sort of turned on axis to the, to the sails to face uh, the wind. But this is brick built, built in, 90, sorry, in 1803. And you see this is on the site of another Anglo-Saxon burial ground up here as well, largely because it probably had the uh, sort of uh, the views right across the Humber estuary itself. 
uh, became had six sails, became uh, gas powered in uh, 1868. And it wasn't a core mill, but exactly the same as the black mill at Hessel, is that it ground chalk to make whitening. Um, and you say this one closed in 1950 and is now part of a pub uh, restaurant as well. I understand from not having been in there is that all the machinery is still inside that mill. So you can say you can see that if you go into that pub it, uh, and itself. That's the marketplace. There's no market taking place uh, here anymore. So uh, unfortunately, uh, because they, it's because they've got quite fine buildings around it, quite a few pubs. That's the George Hotel there. Just looking down there, that's George Street. Uh, this is a really the cross of the H where it links in with the high street at the bottom. I've been twice and I must say it's been very, very quiet uh, both times I've been here and you wonder how many of these shops are going to sort of maintain and it's not full of charity shops. I know you can see one down here, the hospice shop, but there's another one behind me, uh, but most of them are sort of green grocers, butchers uh, and because there were quite a few takeaways uh, as well, but you wonder how many of those are, uh, are going to survive to say that uh, you know, there's 11,000 people live in the town. There's a, we'll see a Tesco later on. There's a, I think it's a little on the way in uh, as well, but you thought that there, there would uh, enough people there because it's quite a long way to anywhere else. The next nearest large town is Scunthorpe, but again, which is about eight miles away. And like I said, there's not really much going on in Scunthorpe. I think Lincoln might be 25 miles to the south and you've got Grimsby uh, uh, again out. And I guess a lot of people might cross the Humber Bridge to go to Hull, which is about 13 miles uh, from here because it necessitates uh, paying the toll across there. So I'll just show you the film of just looking around the town. It's about three minutes this, so, but it picks up on everything that I've done. Uh, so there's no commentary on this, it's just some music. So if you can't hear it properly, uh, is that uh, I know there was a comment last time and I think I forgot to check the tech tick box this time where it says uh, to make it uh, play from the thing. I have to do that at the beginning somehow, but I've forgotten today. But anyway, there's only some music on it. So this is really setting off a Red Lion pub and taking in everything as, uh, we've seen. I'll probably just point out a couple of things as we're about to pass them. You say people live right up into the town centre, lots of houses here. And you say most of them, I guess they're all built of brick, of course, uh, because it being on, on clay. But lovely housing stock and all different sort of styles as well. There's the odd modern house uh, in, in them, but not that many. So this is the Odd Fellows Hall I was talking about, and that's Queen Street going down there to the Wilderspin School. You see the brown sign there, the police station there. Coming in from the right, that's that, that street I just ended on. You see lovely blocks of Georgian houses along here. On to Burgate. This is St Mary's Church. The entrance is just by these trees here. That's that uh, signage there with the uh, sculpture in it. I am going to turn right, but will take us up, but first going to turn left to show you where St. Peter's Church is. Uh, one entrance to St. Peter's is there. You can walk up to it from there. The pond here that stands between the two churches, you can see St. Peter's there. I'm just going around this roundabout here. You just can't quite see the pond area, but that's there. And I must say, this is the narrowest bit of road I've ever had to get through when someone's parked right up to that tree. And that's St Peter's Church. So you can see the distance between them, you can see, very close together. And you can see the mound that it sits on as well, whereas if one sits slightly lower down. So this street here runs parallel to the main shopping street to come down to at the end. You see lovely housing stock uh, along here and you'll see sat back some quite fine houses as, as well. That's the one that Priestgate that leads into the town. That house there, you can see a lovely Georgian house.
So across the road here, that's the more modern Roman Catholic church uh, there. We've got the Volunteers Arms Pub over here. So this is leading up to Baysgarth House. Then that fine bed and breakfast is just that property there on, on the corner. And so the entrance to Baysgarth House, a bit awkward coming through these gates over here. The nice thing you probably like about Barton and Humber is that there's free parking everywhere you go. So this is the entrance to the museum, as they close until next year. The parkland behind it, the Rose Garden to Chadvara. So coming back down to that junction, I had trouble crossing those two bits of film there, turning left onto the Market uh, Street, the windmill up there. And the old marketplace just around here uh, as well. A former bank there, which is now a uh, sort of, a, I think you go and sell your goods and get, gain cash, a cash converters type. The George Hotel, the other one down there is the Wheat Sheaf. So I filmed this on, on a Saturday uh, morning uh, about 11 o'clock. Uh, you expect a town to be sort of fairly busy perhaps on a Saturday, uh, but not here. Because uh, it was a fantastic afternoon, as you'll see from the photographs which I've taken next. It came out about 20 minutes uh, after this. And at the bottom here, we're back on the high street and turning left to come back the way I came in. Um, because it's a more interesting way back to the police station, the Odd Fellows Hall, and not as many silly drivers as I had last time when it was popping out one of those side roads and had to reverse. So that's um, Barton on Humber uh, for you. So let's look at the second part of, of, of Barton uh, and going about half a mile, three quarters of a mile down the road uh, to Barton Haven. Um, so it's best to drive down here. Here you can see the Humber Bridge there and the approach road coming up into town. That's the little roundabout I came to at the beginning and really enough coming back to at the end of that piece of film. And then coming back where the Castle Dyke Primary School is, that was the site of the 5th and 6th, 7th century burial ground uh, uh, as well. You'll also see here that there's a railway station sign as well. It, uh, the line terminates here. It was built in 1849. It was meant to go across to this other side as well, but was uh, never built. And they say it's a community rail line, as they call it today, since 2007. It goes from Barton here all the way to Cleethorpes, about uh, uh, 22 and three quarter miles away. Its importance of, a bit of it being built uh, was that it went to New Holland. New Holland became important um, largely because of people from Hull coming across on the ferry to New Holland. They could get on this railway line, and so this was just like a branch line that came down to Barton, uh, but they could get on that line there and you could go from the junction at New Holland, you could go through Sheffield to Manchester. And it was quicker going that way uh, than it was going from Hull, maybe into Doncaster or Hull to Leeds, and then having to change trains uh, to, a, a, to another provider in the Victorian times in order to get to Manchester. But on this side here, it was all the same railway company. And it was a railway company that owned the ferry that went from Hull to North uh, to New Holland as well. So that was uh, important on there. It's amazing that th actually this line runs today still down here, but it must have been seen important uh, in the 1960s uh, and it still remains today. Because say the services are infrequent uh, during the day, there's a uh, one train every two hours into, uh, into Barton Humber. And you say, you better get it off if you want to connect, get the connecting trains going down to Lincoln or into Sheffield, uh, getting off at New Holland and then changing there, although there might be a direct service from Barton it, itself, but it largely runs along the South Bank. And there's lots of little stations along the uh, line as well. Barrow uh, upon Humber being the next one, three miles away. So coming, looking down here, looking at various things down here, 
I'm going to the rope walk. I'm showing a bit of film uh, just after I talked about this because it's in the car park of Tesco. And you be, when you go in there, you're thinking there can't be an art gallery in the car park of Tesco, but there is. Um, and then behind that, there's the Water's Edge Country Park and Visitor Centre. I guess they can continue on the road round here, and that brings you into that free car park down there. From there, you can walk along the uh, underneath the Humber Bridge here, uh, although you can drive along this road here and go to the old tile works, which is a visitor centre. Then next along, the next road down goes to the Farings uh, visitor, uh, visitor Centre along here. And then you can actually drive to the very end, uh, which I've done, and the metal road turns into a dirt track. But there is a car park at Chowderness and great views across to North Ferriby. You can also walk right of the way along here, that's part of a long distance footpath called the Viking Way, or from the visitor centre here, you can see the dotted line here that goes all along there, and you can walk on that frontage to Immingham and then all the way around to Cleeforps as well. Just picking up this one here, it says William Blythe there, he's, uh, that's a, a, still a brickworks and tile works that operates today. The William Blythe owns the old tile works as well, but there's no production at the old tile works. All the production is down here on that side, but you can see the chimney of it uh, when you're at the Water's Edge Visitor Centre. So I'm just going to show you if you're going to do this in two parts is that uh, to go from the town to the um, to the haven, that's a little bit that comes in here, uh, this is how you get to it. So I'm back at that small roundabout that leads into the high street. But this time it takes you off to the left this time, so I'm really skirting round the outside of the town centre here. There's that little brown sign pointing you down. That's Fleet Gate there, but I was mentioning about. That's the oldest street with the house dating 1332 down there. And there's some, also some rather large Georgian houses as well down there. So that was probably the first iteration of Barton upon Humber. The school here, that's Castle Dyke School. So this road running parallel to Fleet Gate, because so that's where that sort of uh, uh, cemetery was from the 5th to the 7th century, that's where they exhumed bodies from as well. Because so we're here on the clay now. How flat it is. And then turning left at this junction, straight ahead, that is the terminus of the railway line there. It is just a platform, there's nothing else there. And this is where it comes a, a bit of a surprise. That leads down straight ahead to the Humber Bridge car park, where you can park your car and walk under it. But this uh, says Water's Edge Visitor Centre. You can drive straight forward and round to that. But if you're coming to the rope uh, walk, you have to go through the Tesco car park to find it. I've come skirting around the outside large because of the amount of cars that reverse in the center of the car park. This hairdressing salon is also was also part of the rope works as well. I think it was uh, where they offloaded goods, as you can see there from boats that could pull up alongside the rope walk. And so it's this just round here. You can park in Tesco, but there might be a, a time limit on theirs. But the, the rope walk itself is this hugely long building. This is their car park to it. There's no time limit on it all. You can park that side as well. You can say this part up to here is the gallery and, and cafe. The rest of that is called uh, the rope hall. Uh, and because like there's some small businesses in there. So let's have a look at the uh, the rope walk uh, it itself. Uh, but uh, it was founded in 1767 by the Hall family. They were uh, they owned uh, 
boats over in Hull, and so they're like a, a shipping uh, family as well. And uh, you say ships required huge amounts of rope in those days, and they decided that they would establish the rope factory here, largely because they're already growing flax down here for linen because they wanted to make them into uh, sails for the windmills around here. That's why I mentioned the windmill higher up there. And so they already had the skills down here. So in 1767, they opened this up and can say 1800s, then it became uh, a major concern. Even when it closed in the uh, 1989, they're still employing 130 people at the rope walk it itself. And so they're making them for the sailing industry, for whale boats, and also for the Navy uh, as well. It grew so big is that they couldn't grow enough flax locally, so they're importing that as well, really from sort of uh, Northern Europe into here. Came steam driven in 1851, and in the 1890s they expanded into wire because of the, uh, the building of the metal ships uh, in that period uh, as well largely making it for the shipping industry of Upper Beverly, uh, where they're making these sort of uh, boats that could go out to the Arctic up there. So the necessity of using uh, wire for, for, for the ropes. And from the 1900s, the ropes here were marketed under the Hallmark uh, brand. In the 1950s, they had to move with the times and went into synthetic ropes alongside the uh, natural fibre ropes as well. 1986, the Hall family sold it off and uh, it was bought by Bryden uh, in uh, 1989. They make steel uh, ropes that are based or might still be based over in Doncaster, but uh, maybe they want to get rid of the competition. They bought it in 1989 and closed the works immediately with a loss of 130 jobs. It's an enormous works as well. It's about a quarter of a mile long. It's 1,000 312 feet long. Largely, it needed to be very long because they stretched these ropes as well. They could stretch them to about 870 feet um, because of the, needed the tension in that because obviously you didn't want it to, a fisherman to suddenly use it and then, whoa, uh, you know, going from 20 foot to sort of 70 foot uh, wouldn't be any good. So that's the reason for, for knitting, the matting the fibres uh, together up there uh, as well. And I say this second uh, part of it is called the Ropery Hall. And again, it's a not-for-profit organisation They've run this. And there's a cookery school in there. Uh, there's other craft workshops in there. And there's also a theatre in there as well that can hold a few hundred people in there. So it's a, that's why we've got this gate across here uh, to, to cut the Ropery Hall off from the other part that we're going to go, go, go and have a look in. But there's a public right of way because I'm going to walk down here and then go look at the Water's Edge Visitor Centre. But if you go inside the rope walk here, is that uh, say it opened as a gallery in the year 2000. And so alongside here, we've got down here, we've got a, a history of rope manufacture and how ropes are made. When you first go in the top door, because of COVID regulations, it's on a one-way system now, there's a gallery, a large square gallery up there, which has some photographs of the Humber in it when I was there. There's a, uh, a, a cafe there uh, as well. Then you come down the side here and it brings you into a series of sort of three or four different rooms. One of them's got sort of a more art uh, um, creations on display as a, a, or exhibited. And that's what's down there at the moment. I think this lady's made them out of found materials along the Humber itself. Another room uh, has sort of uh, silverware made by local artists. Uh, there's quite a lot of fine pottery as well, mugs, plates and things like that, and sculpture out of pottery as well, largely because due to the clay industry uh, still uh, operating around here. So that's what you can see in there. Like I say, there's a, a cafe there uh, as well. And at the back, you can see this is the haven coming down the back and how they brought the materials in by these little sort of, uh, I guess, uh, uh, wagons that have pushed them in on into the back of the shed. Coming over here, then behind what the full length of the uh, rope works, you come to Barton Haven. It's the whole reason uh, for Barton uh, it, it, it itself. Um, I'm going to say uh, a ferry was first established here or first recorded in here in 1315 because 
it was important to travel that people who wanted to go from Hull maybe to Lincoln would cross to here then pick up a stagecoach to go down to Lincoln. At Lincoln they could probably then connect down to London or to other places as well. Because say it was very important to Hull to have this ferry crossing here because the traffic worked both ways. Uh, really, goods coming into Barton would go to Hull and out. Uh, and so Hull Corporation actually bought the ferry here, but it didn't stop other ferry operators from opening up as well. Hessel, straight across there, then started their own ferry uh, uh, as well. And then um, all these leases had to be paid to the Crown. In 1796, Hull Corporation bought out the Crown's lease of for £3,000 uh, and then collected the rents and tolls themselves. But it really all came to an end in 1849 when they, say, when they built that railway line that connected to New Holland, the new ferry went from Hull to New Holland and 1851 the ferry service had completely uh, stopped at, uh, at Barton. I guess just noting on here, you've obviously got the Humber Bridge there in the background, and also note on here, this is a photograph I took in August when there was a high tide, but look what it's like when the tide is out. Uh, I guess if this is the inlet, I guess if they have to dredge this, as, as you can well imagine, uh, and this is how boats used to get in and out, I guess if by having that depth of water, the channel to come up here. Uh, I guess there were two really landing stages which are no longer there on, on the haven. There's just those boats which are now sort of anchored into the mud at the side. Beyond it, where I took that last photograph from, there's a pedestrian bridge from the pedestrian bridge. It just really goes into more of a drain, really, and uh, I guess they drains this land around here. But really, so it's a very small inlet uh, uh, around here. But like I said, there wasn't one on the other side, and that was the importance of this. Even if you walk along the Viking Way on the other side, there's no other inlets for, 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 for miles. That's what made it Barton very important around here. To the right hand side, I come back to the left hand side, but you know, there is a pedestrian bridge across. To the right hand side, this is the Water's Edge Visitor Centre. This uh, uh, opened in 2000, the building in 2006. And you uh, say, this was on the site of a chemical works and a, um, a cement works as well. And these both closed in the 1980s and the 86, 86 acre site was cleared up in 2001 and expanded to 110 acres. This building opened in 2006 because it's open daily from 10 o'clock to four o'clock. You say uh, around it, they created these ings as well. So these are artificial ones that they put in here, uh, and it really recreates far ings that I'll be looking at uh, in in a couple of minutes, right at the end. And you say they've put paths and duck boards and all sorts of things around that, so you can walk all the way around the ings. This is the centre here, and you can see there's a cafe at the end. You can sit outside, and that's the embankment there to the uh, Humber estuary, which you can get to and walk along. So really, this is all about the habitat uh, around here. So it's all about the nesting birds and the reed beds and things like that. And really at the far end of that, you've got the cafe down there. There's lots of cafes you can go to in Barton. And this isn't the last one that we're going to see. You say there's one in the rope walk, uh, you say just five minutes walk away, and this one. And this is the path that you can walk along just at the side here with the reed beds and salt marshes, uh, looking towards Immingham over here. That's the uh, hull over there. And that chimney there, that's the uh, one of the working brick and tile works owned by the Blythe family. So just let's look the other side so you can cross that haven across a pedestrian metal bridge, uh, which is fairly new, and come up to the, uh, it's marked Humber uh, Park countryside centre or something like that uh, and come along this road uh, you, you turn off this road to go to Tesco and things like that so to carry straight forward this was a former pub here that was built in 1715 I uh, guess this is where the where most of the staves were on this side of of the inlet round here and there are still some I must say very broken down ship uh, repair centres along there as well, so uh, it's largely come to an end. Uh, and so Waterside House was really where goods uh, for the stave were carried to and from. Uh, and I say when it, it, the uh, railway came in 1849, say this died off and then became a pub and it remained as a pub until 1960 and is now a house. 
And then at the end of here, that's a car park uh, where you can park to, again, free to go underneath the Humber Bridge. And you say it's a very fine walk. Uh, and you say just behind the car park, which is in these trees, we've got the Coast Guard uh, Centre there. This is, uh, um, I guess they're now based in Hull, but this opened in uh, 1880. Uh, and they could say no longer in use because it was re made redundant even by the 1920s. Uh, but uh, it doesn't work anymore. But it says here, this is the start of the Viking Way. And it goes from Barton, where I'm stood here, to Oakham in Rutland. It says it's 140 miles. But if you check the guidebook, it's actually 147 miles. Uh, and it goes right across the Lincolnshire Wolds uh, to get there. So. If you park in this car park, you can come on the path which goes underneath the Humber Bridge. That's really the views you're getting. It's a full path. It's uh, not quite tarmac, but it's got a it's a surface footpath, so it's not boggy or anything like that. From that car park by the Coast Guard station, you can walk along this path underneath the Humber Bridge, and, uh, and uh, roughly about ten minutes, you can go down an embankment to the old uh, tile works. I just say when when I was there that the uh, um, the uh, whole uh, Coast Guard uh, uh, came were over here on a, uh, a a trial a dummy run for a mud flat rescue and I did speak to one of the chaps there and uh, really they put. Uh, total uh, equipment on and go on their uh, stomachs dragging like a sledge uh, to put the uh, uh, the person they're rescuing on so there's sort of swimming because they sort of they sink so much that's the only way they can get across told me that the worst part to be on uh, for a rescue is at Paul uh, which is uh, east of Hull uh, because the uh, the mud around there is so slick is that uh, they can't even lie on their stomachs they're sinking into the mud they say it's quite uh, stable uh, the the clay round here but it says unfortunately this took an hour and a half up but it said it would take them over two hours to wash their equipment down because a huge amount of mud on it so going underneath the, say, the bridge, you can turn down or can actually drive to the old tile works. Uh, and this is what uh, this, this one looked like. It's, it's all there. It's owned by the Bly family uh, still. They've uh, made it into really a visitor attraction round here. It opened in 1840 uh, to begin with, but really took off in the 1850s uh, because brick until then, was um, was seen as as uh, to show off because most uh, houses uh, were built in local stone, and if you were a landowner, you wanted to show off you had wealth that you could afford to build in brick, and therefore the government put a brick tax on. They repealed that in 1850, and that's why bricks are a lot cheaper to obviously manufacture, and that's why they started digging the clay around here in industrial quantities. So at one time. 13 brick and tile works in Barton upon Humber alone. There have been probably 60 all along the South Bank, perhaps. Uh, the huge demand for bricks in the Victorian times coming from places uh, like this. And they were bigging, digging the clay and the pits just beyond, beyond here, which are now the Ings. So you can wander around here. That's um, it opened in um, 2000 and 13 of uh, this area did. So they've actually built a cafe uh, come restaurant over there and you can wander around the old brickworks and see inside the drying kilns uh, here. Um, it was quite a simple process uh, and uh, you say one of the buildings they used is, is this one here. The clay would come up a ramp and then be pushed in a machine to be mixed and then would come out as a long square tube. And to make the tiles as seen uh, as they've done in these walls was simply a matter of using a machine to press the pattern down, cut it, and then put it on a drying rack. They had the chimney here largely because those drying sheds were warmed by uh, a coal furnace uh, to make the drying, to bring down the drying times. Nowadays, I think here they, they sometimes air dry them as well. But that takes a, a, a a deal longer and that's why sometimes you see at the bottom of some of the sheds is that there's a gap to allow the air to come into it and obviously it's got roofs on to protect it from the uh, uh, from the elements you can see how close we are to the Humber Bridge there and that's a 
chimney I was pointing out to when we came across the Humber Bridge. And you say some of these outworks as well have been converted into uh, businesses. This is one that's opened fairly uh, recently. Uh, this is a gin distillery called Five Fathoms uh, that opened last uh, year. And there's some other uh, woodworking shops and uh, I think there's a potter there as well. And that's uh, generally open uh, from uh, Wednesday to Sunday from 10 o'clock to four o'clock. But the distillery here isn't open on a Sunday. So it's a lady that makes the gin here from that site. Coming to, towards the end now is that the next road down, it takes us to the Far Ings Nature Reserve. This is owned by the York, uh, the Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust, get it right this time. Uh, like I say, this odd man staring around here is as a bird table with all sorts of uh, birds coming on here. They've, um, it covers 160 acres, the Far Ings Nature Reserve. And I can say it's largely taken up with these uh, former pits uh, as well. Because say these pits were dug in this area between 1850 to uh, 1959 because they taken over by the Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust in 1983. So there's lots of hides to look out and some of these, I say, these clay works absolutely uh, enormous. And here's another one, there's hides all the way around, there's different routes you can take or even drive, drive to. This is one I've gone to when I've gone to Chowder Ness uh, and you say you can look through there and you can see really the area that we're looking at. And just coming to the end, this is where I've gone along the road. Uh, there's a pub called the, uh, I've uh, lost my place now, but uh, um, there's a pub opposite uh, the Tesco turning. And if you turn down there, there's this road that it be it's uh, um, marked uh, to the old tile works, to the Far Ings Nature Reserve as well. And also, if you want to walk on the Humber Bridge from this side, you've got to go on that walk, uh, on that road, and park underneath it. See, it's quite a long way otherwise. If you're going on the Viking Way footpath and thinking you can get onto the bridge, it's about half a mile inland or more to get onto the steps, onto the bridge. So it's easiest to park. Most people park uh, along there and walk up the steps to the east or the west side. Continue straight along that road. It brings you onto this dirt track that brings you out to a car park, at what they call Chowder Ness. What we're looking at there is a, still a cement works in operation. That's at South uh, Therapy. And then you can look round uh, the corner here. Uh, I can say that's a, a marker boy, really, to show where the channel is on the uh, uh, on on the estuary. In sunshine over there, that's North Therapy. So South and North Therapy face opposite one another. And coming to the end, that's the Viking Way. That's the footpath uh, which goes underneath the Humber Bridge. You can see that it's a metal path. All the way down here, the little ramps down off into that Far Ings Nature Reserve into the uh, um, to see the hides and things like that. So that was a, a bit of a longer trip round uh, um, Barton upon Humber. So it's quite interesting area and I say well worth I think lots to do. It's surprising. I was I was amazed uh, around there.